Good morning. Welcome to Renolda Church. If I haven't met you before, my name is Chris. I serve as our executive pastor. Our lead pastor, Alan Wright, is on leave this weekend. He'll be back in the pulpit with us next weekend. Special word of welcome to all those who are worshiping at the Ascent at the Village Campus, anyone who's joining us at the Union Cross Campus, Clemens Campus, or anyone who might be joining us online today. It always happens to me when I'm flying. I always get the seat next to a talker. This time was no different. I was on the plane on the way to Los Angeles, and a lady sat next to him, sat down next to me. Very nice, very kind, very gentle. But my body language suggests that I'm in no mood to talk. After all, it takes a certain combination of sedatives to even get me on the plane. When I get there, I close my eyes, I grip the armrest, and I wait for the damage to be over. This lady decided that she would talk to me, and finally, after I ignored her for what had to be several minutes, she gripped my hand and gently began to sing, Jesus loves you, this I know. Very sweet, but not for me in the moment. I looked at her with one eye open and said, ma'am, if you don't mind, let's not sing about Jesus right now. I'm a little too afraid that I might meet him. She chuckled a little bit and sat there in silence for another minute or two. And then she leaned over and said, well, will this song do? Swing low, swing chariot, coming forward to carry you home. And I said, no, that will not do. Don't sing songs to me about going to heaven. By the time this whole ordeal was done, we were safely in the air. I was nearly asleep. And after we got off the four-hour flight, I said, you know what? You did bring me a lot of comfort. Maybe next time I fly home, you can fly with me and sing to me, but not about songs that take me to heaven. Are you ready for some good news? The life of the Christian is gloriously free with the ability to experience the fullness of the Spirit and the depths of the Word. We don't have to choose between heart and intellect. Our souls are designed to grow through a balance of spiritual communion with the Holy Spirit and through thoughtful study of God's Word. See, loving worship is not at odds with loving study. An exuberant celebration is not at odds with contemplation. Turn with me this morning to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Near the end of the 19th century, Flannery O'Connor wrote one of my favorite short stories called A Good Man is Hard to Find. In this we find the central confrontation is between the grandmother and the misfit. The grandmother brings up praying to Jesus in hopes that she can induce the misfit to spare her life by appealing to his religious sense. It turns out, however, that the misfit probably thought about Jesus more seriously than she ever had. The misfit's doubt in Jesus leads him to think that there is no real right or wrong and no ultimate point to life. The misfit says, Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, and he shouldn't have done it. He continues, he's shown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meaning, meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness, he said. And his voice had come to an almost snarl. See, what the misfit understands is that all of life comes down to one question. What do you think about Jesus? If on one hand you think Jesus is a fairy tale or a myth teller or just a good teacher, then do as you wish. But if on the other hand Jesus is who he says he is, then we ought to do everything we can do to follow him. See, here's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus comes to us as one who wants to be known. This is a big deal. See, 
we're learning together in this series called Unleashed that freedom comes through the most unlikely places, through submission and through authority. And today we're looking at how freedom comes through balance, knowing that Jesus is who he says he is and can transform both the heart and the mind. Be reading from John chapter 1, verses 9 through 14 from the English Standard Version. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, freedom isn't a spiritual escape from the intellect. We aren't called by God to turn off our minds so we can be open to the Spirit. And freedom isn't, on the other hand, an escape from the fears of the Spirit. We aren't called to shut down the moving gifts of the Spirit so that we can fear, so that we won't fear excess. See, we are free to join in the body of believers both word and spirit. This is a theme that comes up frequently in our preaching here at Renolda Church. The idea that Jesus himself comes as fully God, fully man, full of grace, full of truth. See, what we learn in Scripture is that if we're full of only truth, this will ultimately lead to legalism. And if we're full of only spirit, it will ultimately lead to pride. See, if you notice Jesus' teachings, you'll notice something unique about the instructions he gives to people. Who is it, after all, that Jesus is most urgent in his warnings towards? prostitutes or Pharisees? Who does Jesus think is the furthest from the kingdom? Pharisees or sinners? See, Jesus knew something that the religious leaders didn't yet understand. And that's that these sinners were closer to the gospel than the religious leaders because they ultimately knew they were in need of an answer. See, the definition of legalism is simply this. Requiring something that God doesn't. It's a pretty simple definition, I think. Legalism is requiring something that God doesn't. But in the end, it's, it's natural to understand why someone might want to be a legalist. Because in the end, it brings security it's like my kids eating dinner with us at the table, and we said, you have to eat those green beans, and immediately Adam, my 11-year-old, will say, well, how many of the green beans do I have to eat so that I can have dessert? See, he thinks that freedom comes by me identifying all the rules he has to follow, when the truth is, is that if he would just eat the green beans, it would have benefited him more than counting the number and keeping the rules. On the other hand, not only does legalism sometimes bring a sense of security it also nurtures the pride of the person it gives the person the opportunity to say to those that are watching them look how righteous i am the problem is is that in the end being full of only truth ultimately leads to legalism and a false sense of security and a lack of humility so on one hand, being full of truth, being out of balance there, leads to legalism. But on the other hand, only being full of the Spirit can also be equally as misleading. See, without truth, we will ultimately miss the beauty of the gospel. Frequently, when people are asking about the gifts of the Spirit and my position on the gifts of the Spirit that are in the New Testament, 
whether that gift is teaching, speaking in tongues, leadership, or prophecy, people will say, how do you know whether or not those gifts are of the Lord? Meaning, how do you know if someone says they have the gift? How can we trust that gift? How do we know that gift's of the Lord? How do we know that that's a gift that we should put our trust in? And I think the test in Scripture is, is actually pretty simple. It's does the gift, as we're seeing it being used in the body of Christ, does it point to the glorification of the person or the edification of the body of Christ? That's the simple test. The reason that God gave us gifts wasn't so that we ourselves would benefit from it and be built up. On the other hand, God gave us gifts so that through the gifts that he has given us, the body of Christ will be built up. And so on one hand, being full of truth can lead to pride and security in things that aren't necessarily what brings security. But if you're full of spirit and have no truth, what happens is, is that you will find over time that the gift points only to yourself. See, in some ways, full of truth and full of spirit are secular. They feed one another over time. You will find the more you're full of truth, the more you need to be full of spirit to soften and shape the gospel of grace in you that you are sharing with the world. And the more you're full of spirit, the more you'll need to be full of truth to keep you grounded in God's word. And those two feed each other. So a person who is growing in their faith is both full of truth and full of spirit. You know, one of the things that happens is that people try to, I think, characterize or caricature Christianity. On one hand, they would want to say, Christianity is anti-intellectual. Well, Christianity is anti-scholarship, anti-academia. Surely you can't believe in the things that you say you believe in. On the other hand, they might not only say it's anti-intellectual, but they might also say it's anti-experiential. Meaning, you've just turned all of your faith walk with the Lord into an academic exercise. Both of those things are out of balance. Saying that scripture and the gospel of the New Testament as revealed in Jesus' work on the cross is anti-intellectual is incorrect, but to also say it's anti-experiential is incorrect. It is both intellectually rigorous and experientially fulfilling. And when you find balance and the freedom that comes in balance, what you begin to experience is that Christianity can stand up to both of the rigors, being full of intellectual rigor and full of experiential prowess. You know, about once a year, a parent will come to me and they'll say, you know, I've sent my kid off to college or I've sent them off to high school and they've got this one professor and that professor is just trying to convince them that Christianity is not true. Here's what I always tell parents. God is big enough for our doubt. God is big enough for our questions. I am glad to have a conversation about the reliability of the New Testament and the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth with any person who wants to have that discussion. Because I believe that when you put Jesus and the Bible through the same rigor, you put any other book of history or faith or any other person that's existed, I think Christianity stands up as a unique example of what God has done in the world and through the world because of Jesus. And so I don't think that Christianity is anti-intellectual. As a matter of fact, I say use all of the gifts of the academy and the intellect to challenge the premises of Christianity, and Christianity will remain. On the other hand, someone might say to me, I don't care about your experience. Your experience doesn't matter. How you feel doesn't matter. I just want to put Christianity up there with all of the other academic studies how you feel and how you experience the world doesn't matter to me that's equally as wrong 
having an encounter with the risen Christ, having an encounter with the healing presence of the Holy Spirit, having an encounter with the Jesus who was raised from the dead, who came to transform us in spirit, soul, and body, is equally as valid as the academic rigor of studying Scripture for intellectual growth. And so what I'm saying is that true freedom in the Christian world comes when you balance truth and spirit, when you balance intellect and experience. An emerging of the two best represents what scholars call the hypostatic union, the idea that Jesus came as fully God and fully man. As verse 14 says, full of grace and full of truth. Each inform the other. Verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. See, the purpose of the church is to make Jesus and his story known to the world. God has revealed to us his son, the true light, which enlightens everyone who was coming into the world so that the world will know who he is. We know that the New Testament gives us countless examples of Jesus working in the Old Testament. That Jesus was the spiritual rock, for example, that brought water to his children in the wilderness. We know that Jesus was actually the one on the throne in Isaiah 6, who the angels are singing to, holy, holy, holy. We know that he is the Savior of Isaiah 52 and 53, and the one that would be our substitute. Jesus is the fulfillment of every shadow. I've told you this story before about that my one master class with my children every evening is shadow puppets. I can do remarkable things with shadow puppets. I can do rabbits and rocks and rabbits and rocks. And occasionally I stumble myself into a butterfly. So I remember when Adam was five years old and I was doing shadow puppets with him at night. And finally he said, enough with the shadows. Give me the real bunny. Because at some point the shadow is unfulfilling. At some point it's so clear that what you want is the real thing and all the types and shadows of the old testament are fulfilled in jesus who there's not a word on any page of all of scripture in the old testament that's not pointing forward in human history to the time when jesus would come see jesus is the true light as opposed to shadows and symbols. J.C. Ryle says it this way, Christ is to the souls of men what the sun is to the world. He is the center and source of all spiritual light. Like the sun, he shines for the common benefit of all mankind. For high and for low, for rich and for poor, for Jew and for Greek, like the sun, he is free to all. All may look at him and drink help out of his light. If millions of mankind were mad enough to dwell in caves underground or to bandage their eyes, their darkness would be their own fault and not the fault of the sun. So likewise, if millions of men and women love spiritual darkness rather than light, the blame must be laid on their blind hearts. But whether men will see or not see, Christ is the true sun and the light of the world. There is no light for sinners except the Lord Jesus. People don't write like that anymore. Probably because of television. He didn't have any television, so he had a lot of time to write smart things down. Jesus is the light of the world, shown to the world so that they may know that light exists. Verse 10 continues, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. For 30 years, Jesus of Nazareth lived among his people. And the first time that he came back to preach to them, they tried to kill him. He grew up in school with them. 
He was the carpenter's son. It's likely that Jesus of Nazareth had fixed things in their home, adjusted their doors that didn't line up correctly, fixed their thresholds, adjusted their tables, built chairs for them, built toys for their children. But yet when he leaves and begins his ministry and comes back, their first instinct is to act as if they don't know him. And they tried to kill him. See, he demonstrated his creative power, didn't he? He gave people limbs. He gave people organs. He gave people eyes and hearing. He gave people life from death, controlled storms, and walked on water. Verse 12 continues, And to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. This but of God is a uniquely Christian idea. Other religious traditions spend much of their energy explaining the separation between humanity and the Creator. But Christianity is doing something altogether differently. See, the freedom of balance that's seen in Christianity demands that God came and lived among his people. This freedom, through spirit and truth, came because God is not far off from us, but instead came and lived among us. Watch this. The scriptures are clear that we are tripartite. That's a fancy theological word that suggests that we are three parts. Scripture says it over and over again, that we are spirit, soul, and body. Interestingly, it always lists them in that order, spirit, soul, and body. Now, we would argue around Renolda that that's because that's a linear order giving value to what is subservient to the other. So the spirit has dominion over the soul and the soul over the body. But let's talk about what this means for just a minute. We are spirit, soul, and body. Our bodies were shaped out of the clay and given integrity and dignity and uniqueness because of God. And God is in the process of redeeming all things, including the brokenness of our bodies. Most scientists believe that our bodies peak between 27 and 37, depending on your level of activity and your genome makeup. Most of us are past the point in our lives where we have peaked physically. We have grown, we have extended our abilities, and now we're on the other side of the hill. And probably every day, in some unique way, you see the ways in which your body is decaying. Well, the good news of Scripture is that the frailty of our bodies is a result of sin, and God has made a plan to bring victory over the decaying body. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 and 44 says this, There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For the stars differ from the star in glory. So it is that with the resurrection of the dead, what is sown perishable, what is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, decaying, broken, natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. It's the promise that spirit, soul, and body, the body is going to be redeemed because of the work of Jesus. God is at this very moment making a place for our physical body, which will be glorified in the second coming, to find a place in eternity with him forever. We are also soul or mind. I wish I had more time to talk about how it is that God has shaped our souls. 
The theological category might be called Imago Dei. We are created in the image of God. In every day, you benefit from something called common grace. This is the idea that God, through His grace and sovereignty, is benefiting all people, both saved and unsaved, both believer and non-believer. As a matter of fact, Colossians 1 says that Jesus is, in fact, holding together the universe. Common grace. We see it in really tangible ways. God allows moisture to fall on the dry ground so that new life can spring forth. But there are other ways that common grace works out in our lives that we might miss. We believe in something called total depravity. That's a fancy way of saying all of us have sinned and all of us, apart from a unique effort of Jesus, stand apart from God's holiness. But we do not believe in something called utter depravity, meaning we are not as bad as we could be. What does that mean? There is something in the world that is restraining the flesh restraining the mind from doing the thing that it might naturally want to do. There is something that's keeping us from being the worst version of ourselves. Some might call it, we have a conscience. Our mind is restrained. See, in the creation, God deposited it in the world a bit of his common grace that not only holds the universe together and sustains his creation, but also leaves people with a reflection of who he is. Body, soul, but the spirit is something altogether different. Ephesians 2, 1 and Colossians 2, 13 said that we were dead in our sins. It's very clear that what it's talking about here is that our spirits were dead. One of my favorite stories in all of Scripture is Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John's John's Gospel. I love Nicodemus because he's not a bozo. Most of the guys who come to Jesus in the Bible are an absolute mess, including the people that he calls to follow him, but not Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a great guy in the world's eyes, a man of integrity and hard work. A man of morals and values. So when you're reading Nicodemus, the story in John chapter 3, and you're seeing what it means to be called a sinner, you have to read that in context. See, Nicodemus was good and religious and disciplined. So when people say, oh, to not be a sinner means to be good, well, that can't be true. Because Nicodemus was already good. Well, to be Something different than a sinner means that you need to be more disciplined. Well, no, no. Nicodemus is already disciplined. He was already a religious person. He was already held in high esteem among his peers. So when Nicodemus says that he needs to be born again, he can't be talking about being better, doing better, saying the right things. He was already doing those things. Nicodemus understands something of the depth of the beauty of the gospel. See, in the end, we have to ask ourselves, do we really believe that all have sinned? That there is no difference among all of people? The best way to see this, actually, is in the preaching ministry of Paul. See, in Romans 1, he says that Jews, that Gentiles and pagans are all the same. In Romans 2, he says religious people, there's no difference. Do you think that Paul, before his conversion, would have said all people were the same? No. As a matter of fact, his entire life was built on holding up Judaism as the premier example. See, in a very unique way, Christianity stands in contrast to everything that people actually say about it. People say, well, the uniqueness, the exclusivity of the Christian gospel dehumanizes people. But if you look at actually the people who are preaching the gospel, the people who understand the gospel in the Bible, they're not dehumanizing people. They're doing what some might call rehumanizing people, meaning they're not looking at people as pagans 
or religious people, as Jew or Gentile, male or female, black or white. They're saying, no, all of you are the same. All of you have fallen short of the glory of God. I would argue that while Christianity makes exclusive claims about who Jesus is to the world, it's the most inclusive religion in the whole world because it says it doesn't matter what you bring to the table. God has revealed himself in Jesus. And the great equalizer isn't money or social stature or what you uh, believe in or where you grew up. In the end, the thing that makes us all equal is that we're all sinners running away from God. And Jesus rehumanizes all of us. The definition of sin for Paul in, in the New Testament isn't breaking rules or even missing the mark. In Genesis 3, it wasn't about rules. As a matter of fact, God didn't use one of the moral absolutes, don't steal, don't kill, don't lie, something that everybody agrees about, a moral absolute to divide the world into right and wrong. I find it interesting that God didn't say, hey, don't have adultery, don't commit adultery. That's the thing that will get you kicked out of the garden. Now, that would have been actually kind of hard because there were only two people and they were actually married. So adultery would have been a difficult task. But he didn't say, hey, don't steal or don't kill. Instead, God says, don't eat the fruit. Well, the fruit wasn't even poisoned. What was it about? It wasn't about moral absolutes. It was about making themselves in the image of God. They were substituting themselves for God. The rule simply means don't put something else in my place. So what happens at new birth is this. A dead thing comes to life. The body is being restored through God's common grace in the world and God's restorative act that will come to culmination at the end of time. The soul, the mind is being transformed every day. It's a battlefield, but we're having our mind renewed. But the thing that happens at new birth is that the spirit that is dead in you is given new life. Nicodemus knew it. Paul experienced it. And it's the unique claim of the gospel. And John says in chapter 1 that you become a part of a new family. Because God has placed his spirit in you. We got a new dog. We got a new dog named Amelia. Isn't she precious? I'd like to tell you that this is an actual picture of my dog. It's not. This is a photo I stole off the internet because my dog, Amelia, won't hold still. She's too busy chewing, peeing, and pooping her way through my house. She's about 22 weeks old, and she is absolutely crazy. And I promise you this, that if I brought Amelia, who is cute and precious and crazy, over to your house and left her there when no one was home for 12 hours, there would be no doubt that she had dwelt in your house. The trash would be everywhere. She would have jumped up on your bed and peed on your pillow. She would have looked at your brand new, freshly washed pile of towels. And you would think, oh, it's so sweet. She wants to lay down on that pile of towels and take a little rest. And you would quickly realize that that is not what she was doing. She was going to the bathroom on your freshly washed towels. That cute dog right there. She would leave no doubt that she was in your house. That's the beauty of the gospel. When we're full of truth and full of spirit, God dwells in his fullness in us, and he leaves no doubt who's taken up residence in our spirit. See, the key to this text, to being full of grace and full of truth, is in verse 14. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The King James Version, I think, actually translates this better. It says, we have beheld his glory. This is a better translation of the Greek word because it means to gaze on. We have gazed on his glory. It's saying that the word, this divine person, Jesus is the word, and he created the whole world, that this great divine thing became flesh, became weak. And when I see Jesus dying on the cross for me, it's so that God could be a God of grace and truth. This is the beauty of the cross. On one hand, God says, I am full of justice. I am full of truth. Sin must be paid for. And so he allows his only begotten son to be hung on the cross of a thief, executed under a penalty that wasn't his, so that God's insistence that truth and justice be upheld could be satisfied. But on the other hand, God is full of spirit and grace. So at the same time that his justice must be satisfied, his mercy must be shown. And so he allowed the justice that poured down on his son through his grace to benefit us. And on the cross of Calvary, we see the only perfect example of being full of grace and truth in the finished work of Jesus. The beauty of the gospel is simply this. The God of the universe who spoke creation into existence wants to be known. And so he wove into every part of his created order Our body, his creation, the shouting message that God exists. That anyone could look with an unbiased eye, with the intellectual rigor of the world and say, the creation shouts for a creator. And by doing so, he deposited in us those whom he shaped out of the mud and breathed life into the characteristics of a God that has shared with us his common grace. We have dignity and integrity and value because God saw it, and he is at this very moment not only holding together with his very hands all of creation, but is sustaining us through his common grace in the world and shaping us so that we will be drawn towards him. And at the same time, God allowed his only begotten son, full of truth and full of grace, full of word and full of spirit, to hang on the cross so that it would be demonstrated to us what it looks like to be full of grace and truth, but more so so that the possibility that we could be full, completely free in the balance of truth and grace the potential is now there for us to be shaped into the likeness of jesus every day god wants to be known by you and he wants you to know that you are known the gospel of jesus christ can withstand the academic rigor of the world the experiential deference that many of us give it. And we can, in the midst of that balance, find the true freedom of the God of the universe who has made a way where there's seen no way, who has given life where death once existed and planned your life for purpose and a destiny so that the world 
may gaze upon him and see his glory. And that's the gospel.